أهلا وسهلا فيكم جميعكم عربا ويهودا إسرائيليين وفلسطينيين في هذا اللقاء المشترك بسنة 2004 برضو مجموعة من قوات الاحتلال أطلقت النار على ابني أبين شلي نفال بتسبع والمعبت هو لا ميلا يش له صورة والصورة هي لا يفا أني رأيت ربيه מאוד מרגש לראות את הקבוצה הגדולה הזאת, גם אם יהיה רגעים לא פשוטים, שנדע להיות איתם ביחד. כן, אני הייתי חייבת, 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 אני مش عشان أغير إشي في في رأيي لأنه هاي الأشياء ما تغيرت شو وجهة نظري واضحة مثل ما هي يعني أنا كانت يوم استشهاد ابني كان يوم صعب جدا علي إني زخرت التسمية تفسدت التيارات شلي هو أدت كلي فرات سلا بالكلات كشرة نيرك فريت يربي وتر مفوجرت وهاد بيقدر يرفع البلوز شوي ونشوف السلاح اللي حامله وبنعرف لحالنا ايش يعني الاحتلال you know why I have that because every day Arab people throwing stones and بكبوكتا فيرا الجندي تحت اي مسمى او تحت مسمى جندي لانه ضمن دوله وضمن حكومه ها هي كانت اللي انا اللي بسال عنه ليش أنا ما بوزي بالإرهابي؟ يا ريت بن 18 لو كان ببوكر ببخير شو رتل إلا أخذي كروفي خيالين لو أفهم لأموت بمخصومين بالعربية لأغفيم زي لو كاخة أتم رؤيم زي لو نخون ليش أنا بحس إنه في خوف في خوف من من الجانب الفلسطيني ومن الجانب الإسرائيلي يجي يحضر الورشة يهودي متطرف أنا بالنسبة لي هذا إنجاز على الأقل أنا مش رح أقنعه أو مش رح أغير له تفكيره بس أقل ما فيها أجا وسمعني سمع شو معاناتي كل الفلسطينيين يجوا عشان إسرائيليين כל הישראלים ידמנינו שהם פלסטינים. שבילי ערבי טוב, ערבי טוב, ערבי מת. אבל שימם נאדר נשמח לכם תרשו על הלבלד נהאיין. אני לא יכול לאפשר לכם לחזור בכלל. לאינו תעריבה פי סטה מיליון פלסטינים הג'רין ברה לבלד. ואיזה בדנן רג'ה חדו לפלסטינים עלי מרפוד פי דולת ישראל. ומנעתזר מנכם הד הטלב מרפוד קטעין. היום כשאני מסתובב בקניון, כשאני מסתובב בעיר, אני רואה ערבי, ערבייה. אני מסתכל עליהם אחרת. When I heard to another side, another story, I'm thinking, why hit, hit people? Thank you. Thank you. זה דוגמה של מפגש שיוצר הזדהות, יוצר אמפתיה, יוצר הבנה. יוצר הבנה, אפילו מודעות, עזבו הבנה, לפני ההבנה, יוצר איזושהי מודעות. באמת לקושי ולמורכבות שבו נתון לצד השני. שלום, שלום. 
המפגש הראשון שלי עם הקונפליקט היה בשנת 56. אני זוכרת את עצמי בתור ילדה קטנה, זוכרת את אימא שלי תולה וילונות שחורים להפעלה, וזוכרת אותנו יושבים במקלט צפופים ורועדים. הפעם הכי משמעותית הייתה ב-73, אני כבר הייתי אימא. אימא לתינוק קטן, ואני זוכרת את יום כיפור, ואני זוכרת את האזעקה, ואני זוכרת את עצמי תופסת את הילד שלי, רועדת כולי, ורצה למקלט. כשרז נהרג כבר הייתי הרבה יותר מבוגרת. כנראה נעימים בלבית, אחותי ואמי, אבוי כאן מתווי, כנראה זרר, אג'ל ג'יש על הבית, כסר הבית, תקלו אחותי לתנין, כאן יום הסו אל-עג'איב פינע, פי אמי, אמי בדהש תחליהם יוכדו אולדה, והם מדעוה, ואחדו אולד, וזלת תבקי אמי, ואנה גולת יעני, נהרק אליום, عمري ما بنسى لاني انا شو خلي خلى امي تعيط يعني ليش تخليها تعيط؟ حقدت عليهم لانهم خلوا امي تعيط وتبكي على اولادها والمره الثانيه لما استشهد ابني انا كانت يوم استشهاد ابني كان يوم صعب جدا علي و بقدرش اوصفها بقدرش احكي عنها بقدرش כשאני שומעת את הפלסטינים היום מדברים, אני מרגישה שזו פעם ראשונה היום שאני נפגשת בסכסוך באופן אמיתי. תמיד שומעים ורואים ויודעים, אבל לשמוע את האנשים מספרים את סיפור חייהם הכואב, אז אני מרגישה שזו הפעם הראשונה שאני נפגשת בזה. ולא קל לי להיות בצד ששייך ל... למי שמכאיב. ביום 16-9, כאן היום האחרון שלי בשביל השנה האחרונה, וכאן תאריך מילדי. במסע הדעת היום, أنا كنت رايح أجيب أدوات هندسية من صديق لإلي بالطريق كان في مجموعة من جنود الاحتلال اعترضوا طريقي بدون أي وجه حق وبدون أي سلوك يتنزل الجندي زي المصروع عن ظهر الاسطوح بلش يضرب فيه ألا فيما بعد مجموعة جنود يعني هجمت علي وبعد ما حطوا فوهة البندقية بتمي وعشق السلاح وهو بتمي وعماله بقول لي إنه بده يقتلني المفقاش الرشون شلي مع كيبوش الفلسطيني والترور الفلسطيني شأنه مبخين بين مش بوشيا لمش خاف من بيشا ومركب من كما وخامة تخانات إيه شيء אחות של חבר שלי מאוד טוב, שהיינו ביחד בתיכון, הלכה לה לטומאה בירושלים, בשוק מחנה יהודה, ובתוך אוטובוס שחלף לידה התפוצץ מחבל פלסטיני, הרג איתו לא מעט אנשים, וביניהם גם אותה. זו הייתה תחנה ראשונה. תחנה שנייה הייתה משפחה של חבר אחר שלי, גם כן מהתיכון, שגר בגוש קטיף, בנווה דקלים, והיה שם חקלאי. והיה לו שותף פלסטיני שעבדו שנים על גבי שנים ביחד, היו הולכים אחד לאירועים של השני וערב לפני שהוא נרצח על ידי אותו שותף, הוא הזמין אותו, הוא היה בחתונה של הבן שלו ולמחרת הוא בא ורצח את השותף שלו שאחרי שנים של חברות ועבודה ביחד זה המפגש שלי עם ה... 
يبوش احنا طرحنا كموضوع جدلي برز في هذا المو... في هذا ال... الورش جدليا اطرح على الاحتلال الاسرائيلي وعلى الطرف الاخر ان يبرهن بانه احتلالا فلسطيني ما بصير انه يتم مناقشه موضوع دار في دائره مجموعه ناس مثقفين وواعيين وناضجين وبالنهايه نستخلص موضوع الاحتلال الفلسطيني There were some papers outside, and there were a couple of bios of our guests here today. And so I don't want to go into detail and waste too much time, because we, have, we do have some time uh, for question and discussion. Uh, but I do want to say that both have, in, in similar ways and some very different ways, both have endured pain, uh, suffering, profound loss, and have come to realize um, the importance of a nonviolent road to reconciliation. So uh, please join me in welcoming Roby Damalan and Basam Aramin to the stage, and we'll open up a discussion. Where do you want me to sit? In the middle? Yes. Well, let's move a bit closer. Wow. No, it's okay. <laughs> if you have questions, we do have microphones, so if you want to be asking questions, go ahead and line up. Um, let me start. I mean, that was, it's quite a powerful film, a, a very, in a way, brief snapshot of an intense and kind of long process. And what I just wanted to open up by asking you to do is to provide a little of the context for this film. I followed this as uh, watching this as, as we funded it and watched it develop. It was years in the making, not without problems and difficulties, obstacles. Provide, just start by providing a little bit of the context for the development of this film. Well, it was, the idea was for it to be part of a series of workshops that we've done that were um, actually more homogeneous. So we'd had 13 of these groups and we are continuing. It's becoming very fast our flagship uh, activity because we realize how powerful it is and how people, after they're finished, the workshop are continuing to meet. Um, of course, it was very difficult. It's a co-production, Palestinian and Israeli. Um, nobody could do anything without the approval of the other. The script was approved by both sides. And uh, when the film was made, it was checked to see if there were any sensitive issues. And like everything else, but the understanding and the dialogue that went on with the filmmakers was incredible. So even that was an exercise because they were just filmmakers. They, didn't, they weren't part of the parent circle. Do you want to add? Uh... Actually, one of the things in the movie... Uh... Like for the Palestinians, after 65 years of occupation, the first time you have the opportunity to sit down with the Israelis as normals, as individuals, so he wants to understand them, and he wants, uh, he asks them to help him. It means uh, we lost this uh, personal contact between the Israelis and the Palestinians, which shows when you discover the other side or the humanity in the other side, you make the progress, and you need to uh, believe in yourself when you decide that I am as an individual, I cannot do anything, this is the political system, we will kill each other forever, that's it. You need to decide that I can do the change. And this is what happened actually in the movie. We start to move a little bit uh, to the direction of understanding each other. Okay. Questions? We can take a question over here. Uh, yes, my name is Ira Weiss. Um, my question is this. Since 1993, there have been scores of workshops, perhaps hundreds, bringing Israelis and Palestinians together. I myself was in, started an organization. We brought Palestinians and Israelis together for four summers in Spain uh, 12 years ago, starting 12 years ago. 
So for 20 years, this has really been going on. Dialogues just like this have been going on for 20 years. Why have they not brought us anything? I mean, my impression is things are worse today than they were 20 years ago. Well, the question is, shall we give up hope? What's the alternative, yeah? I can't afford to. Maybe if I lived in the States, I could. And I have to say that um, something very special happens within the framework of the parent circle. Because we are who we are, the 600 families, all of us have lost immediate family members. Um, we have a standing in the community so that when we do a, a workshop, it's not about rainbows and flowers and bad poetry. You know, there's an example of people who have paid the highest price who can actually find a way to talk to each other and find a way to sit on a platform together and speak in one voice. So that's really the example that we can set. It isn't to say that everybody comes away from that workshop being Martin Luther King. But what it does say is when you look at them, when you look at the settler who suddenly has another perception of the life of the Palestinian, and when you look at the religious man who comes away saying, when I go to the mall, when I look now at Palestinians, I look with a different eye, that's a breakthrough. The role of our organization is to be, to create an emotional breakthrough. And yes, I know there are many, many workshops, but I think that whatever we can do, sometimes like taking water out of the sea with a teaspoon, but whatever we can do is so much more important than not doing anything. And I have watched these groups now. The teachers are still meeting. The artists are working together. Um, the grannies, there was a granny group, are still in contact all the time. So I have hope. This film does give me hope. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, I can tell you, like, I'm one of the uh, results of this dialogue group or workshops. I am already free. No one can occupy me. And uh, I have no enemy, which is enough. Over. Hello, Robbie, Michelle Sumka, how are you? <laughs> um, I have a technical question about the groups. Do you only meet in places like the Everest Hotel where Palestinians and Israelis can meet? And also about where the participants are from. Was the fellow from Heb that w the group that went to Hebron, is the fellow from Hebron? I didn't understand the very last part. Where the, how do you meet in a way? Do you always meet in that same place? And are you talking about the obstacles? And to then in together? the in the film, the man who was going down Shuhada Street, is he from Hebron? Yes. Yes. Um, we meet very often at the at Everest because it's so convenient, because the Palestinians don't need permission to come there. Um, as a member of the parent circle, I do a lot of work in places where I'm not exactly supposed to be. But um, yes, we meet and we manage to get uh, um, permission for Palestinians to come to Israel as well. And um, it's just that we used that place because it was convenient. People came from all over the country, some from Sderot. It was quite an interesting process to look for the people who would take part in it. It's not so easy. It would have been easy to find a whole bunch of you know, peace-loving people, but that wasn't the object. And that's why if you would have, if we would have made a film about, say, the artists or the teachers or the health workers group, it would have been very different. There would have been a lot more emotional breakthrough in that. But this is if taking such a wide gamut of the Israeli and Palestinian public, that's why it wasn't quite as emotional as you would expect. But there were amazing things that happened you know, over the course, and yes, they are in touch. And when we've done screenings all over Israel and Palestine, um, people have come and some of the protagonists of the film also came to talk to the question and answer. Hassan? Does someone want to say anything? No, we meet in Everest. I agree with you. Good afternoon to you, uh, Bassan and Bobby. I'm Phyllis Gilchrist, a graduate student at Georgetown I'm sorry, University. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. 
I, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Good afternoon to you, Hassan and Ravi. Ravi. I am a uh, graduate student at Georgetown University, Phyllis Gilchrist, and I want to thank you both for visiting with us on Tuesday on the campus. And I wanted to ask a question that I um, wasn't able to get a, a resolution on on Tuesday, and it was the um, how much, if any, of the uh, Parent Circle Project derives uh, its methodology or its uh, procedures from the South African Reconciliation Commission project and program? Well, we went to South Africa to look at South Africa to see what lessons we could learn from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And yes, we got a great affirmation of the work um, that they did. And, we are, and for the work that we are doing. Um, South Africa is not Israel and Palestine, but certainly we can learn lessons from there. And there is another film which we made about this whole journey. It's called One Day After Peace. And we've been showing it all over. And this is the South African-Israeli um, contact. And I, I, yes, we are doing a paper on reconciliation, and much of it is also based on some of the frameworks that they used in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But one should always remember that cultures are different and religions are different. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for the film. My name is Blake Selzer and I work for CARE International. And I've been to the region and I think it's a, I really like the film and I, and I hope it gets a lot of exposure. I had a question and a comment. My question was, how are you distributing it? How, what kind of, um, besides the one here today, how it's getting out there? And then my comment is I noticed that it's funded by USIP and USAID. I'm not sure if people in this room know this, but USAID has, has had a hold placed on it for all funding for the region for funding to go to the Palestinian Authority for the last year. So I think it would be good for 535 people up the road uh, to be seeing this film because uh, we're still under a hold and there's members of Congress who don't, I don't think, see enough of putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Thank you. I don't really understand what, I, what must I say now. He speaks English. <laughs> you can say you visited Congress, perhaps, did you? Oh, yesterday we were, <laughs> I see what you, okay. Yesterday we were in Congress. We had a congressional uh, briefing at breakfast time. And uh, certain congressmen were there, which was great. We had a, a wonderful opportunity to tell them how we are using the funds both from USIP and USAID and how they have helped us because it, that's the main funding for the parent circle. So for us, it's unbelievably important because we want to continue with this project. The, the film, and I would like to give a challenge here, um, where is Shiri? Right in the back of the room, we have Shiri Orian, who is the executive director of the Friends of the Parent Circle, the American Friends of the Parent Circle. And if anybody would like to arrange a screening uh, in their church, in their synagogue, in their community center, at home for 50 or 60 people, if you've got that kind of house, then Shiri's the person to talk to. You can also order um, this film, and uh, we, we would be happy for you to use it because the more, we will also have a screening guide which will help with these kind of questions. So that's the answer for the moment, I hope. We're using it a lot in Israel and Palestine now. Um, it's not always as friendly as this, but it's very, very important. I hope it, we use it more here as well. I beg your pardon? I hope we use it more here as well. Well, that's up to you guys, you know. You always ask, what can we do for you? Well, that's a really good answer. <laughs> Sorry? There was a question about putting it on YouTube, I guess, but I think it needs to, I think it'll be It has to go with the screening guide. It has to be something in an atmosphere where people can actually talk afterwards. Okay, please. Hello, um, my name is Whitney Lauderback, and I spent the last three years working at a mediation organization in Northern Ireland. And a lot of what I struggled with um, working there, because we were having a lot of the similar conversations, was how do you translate interpersonal empathy into national peace? 
If I knew the answer to that, would I be sitting here? <laughs> I'd be in the White House. No. Um, it's, it's like working from top down and bottom up. You answer that. Because, you know, because the gender equality issue, I let her speak all the time, which is okay. Uh, it starts from the individual, from the personal level. Uh, you can create like in the interna international level. So uh, it's actually, this is what I said. This is what we start to make this uh, process, uh, the personal level, and then to uh, create more people around the idea uh, to make it in the national level. It also needs to be taken into consideration that there hasn't yet been a reconciliation process in Ireland. So maybe, you know, that's what's missing in the equation. And I think it's missing for us too. That there can't be, I mean, you know, many people will say, why are you doing this before there's a political agreement? And the answer is that we are the ants on the ground that are preparing it. There has to be that framework in place. That's the vision of the parents' circle altogether, and that's why we do all of this, is to create a framework for a reconciliation process to be an integral part of any future peace agreement. Otherwise, it's a ceasefire, as it's a ceasefire in Ireland. It's not peace. Uh, my name is Howard Yort. I'm with Rock Spring Church. Um, after all of this, it still seems that there are serious misunderstandings between the groups and within the groups. <clears throat> I'm wondering, my question is, do you believe it will be necessary to have a full-fledged Truth and Reconciliation Commission before you can get to lasting peace? I think it's, it's very difficult, uh, and if you ask me personally, I, I support that, I agree with that, because we need to prepare. In the end, we need to have this Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, uh, because it's not personal, and we need to end this problem uh, to prepare after the peace agreement, absolutely, but this is what we are going to, uh, to do now. And if we can do it now to prepare, uh, yes, we can. And I said always, I am the first Palestinian. I am ready to make this thing and to forgive my killer who killed my 10 years old daughter if he come and ask me forgiveness to be a good example for the other people. Thank you. I, I thought it was an excellent movie. Um, my name is Victor Miller, a uh, long term long -term activist in the Israeli-Palestinian discussion. Um, my, my question is, is, is there any consideration or do you think it would be of any use to have a more uh, a contact between Palestinians and, <coughs> and Jews outside of, of, of Israel? Outside uh, in the in the United States, there's very little. There's very little. The, the, the cross currents are few and far between. Uh, I'm going to uh, South Africa in a few weeks, and I know that you know that probably most South African Jews have never seen have never seen an Arab, uh, let alone talk to them about peace. I think if there were a, 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 an effort to to you know, to have these two communities talk to one another around around the world. Of course, that's an exaggerated comment. But uh, and my other question is: uh, you, uh, Are both these movies movies available uh, for that one can show it in a private setting? Yes, I see. And so Shiri, Shiri is your man. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the saddest parts about this whole conflict is that people are pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. And what you're doing with that attitude is you're importing our country, our conflict into your country, 
and creating hatred between Jews and Muslims. That's about the last thing that we would want. And so if you can't be part of the solution, I, that's not to say please do not be involved. Be part of the solution because don't be part of the problem. You're not helping, not us and not the Palestinians. It's better to stay out of it all together. However, if you are willing to work together, then that is amazing. Thank you. I want to say one other thing. There is in, in Washington, probably many of the audience know this, a group called the Peace Cafe run by Andy Shalal. Uh, that's where I've learned so much over the last 10 or 15 years. And it's really, um, he runs a restaurant, Busboys and Poets. It's downtown. And um, he's, he's really a, a wonderful activist, has done very, very good work. Sorry to come. Thank you. Let's take another one from over here. Ned. Uh, thank you very much, Ro Roby and Bassam. Uh, and I wanted to ask a question and also uh, respond to the earlier questioner who asked after 20 years of uh, this work, why is there not, uh, is there not peace in the Middle East? And uh, I think that's a question that, uh, first of all, we, us in Washington, should ask ourselves. We're much closer to uh, the uh, corridors of power where people can make decisions that have uh, an impact on a national level. Uh, and if you're moved to do so by this film, then all the better. Uh, and I just uh, would say I was in Israel for two weeks uh, uh, doing some research on the parents' circle uh, and found, I asked them, can I go to some events? And they had events every day for the two weeks uh, that I was there in schools, in colleges, uh, dialogue groups like the ones that you saw. These are the hardest working people that I think I've ever, ever seen for this cause. Bassam uh, spoke to three different classes at uh, a college in Sterot, uh, the Israeli city that they mentioned that is hit by, has been hit by so many missiles uh, in, the last, uh, in the last eight years. So uh, I hope that we'll continue asking how can we change the situation, uh, but also acknowledge the incredible work that people are doing on the ground. They, uh, they are not the reason that the problem has continued uh, and we need to find ways to help them and echo the work that they're doing. I think this film does this very well. Question uh, just for Bassam. I know that you work actually for two different uh, peace initiatives. You're the founder of another one, and I hope that you could uh, also mention uh, that initiative, that other group that you formed to the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I'm a co-founder of uh, uh, another uh, joint organization, Palestinians and Israelis, called Combatants for Peace, which is from ex-Israeli soldiers and officers who refused to serve in the occupied territories because they discovered that they didn't serve the Israeli security or protect Israel. They just create more enemies and more hatred in the Palestinian side. And from our side, the Palestinian side, who are ex-prisoners or ex-freedom fighters, who spend many years from their life in the Israeli jails and have an uh, active part in the armed struggle or a violent struggle against the occupation. Uh, like me, I spent seven years when I was 17 years old. Uh, it's a very active and unique group, and we decide to let down our weapons and uh, uh, use the nonviolence ways against the, our common enemy, which is the occupation, as a source of uh, violence and terror and which prevent us to live uh, to, uh, in a normal way uh, in our country. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Over here. Hello, I'm Pamela Nice. Uh, I wondered, I have two questions. Do you think most Israelis know what it is like to live in a settlement and are aware of that reality? My second question is, have you ever been able to visit a settlement as part of your work? I think there's nothing more important than talking to the settlers, because if we don't, and we exclude them from the conversation, they will become more radical. Um, I think most Israelis have not the faintest idea what's going on in the occupied territories. Maybe they don't want to know, but they certainly don't travel there and don't see with their own eyes. 
Sometimes it's very hard um, when you're Israeli, and I'm Israeli, and I love Israel. It's my country. But I want to live in a country that has a moral fiber, and I think this occupation is killing the moral fiber of Israel. And so this is part of the work, is to talk to the settlers, to make them be included in the peace process. And yes, we will talk to anybody who's willing to listen. Actually, actually, I was in, in, in a few settlements and talked to the settlers. We start the dialogue with the, the promised land. God give us this piece of land. Then a little bit we discover that this big God is uh, Belfort. After that, the government put us here. Uh, Netanyahu is the God. Then, if there is any peace settlement, we will go back to Israel, some of them or some of them ready to live under the Palestinian Authority, for example. Uh, it means, yeah, I, I agree with Romy that we need to talk to them as individuals. Okay. Howard. Thank you. Um, Howard Sumka, welcome to both of you. It's a great film, as all of your films are. I have two questions which are sort of intended to be fair and balanced about the environment in which you find yourself working these days. I know for a number of organizations that the anti-normalization movement in Palestine has made it extremely difficult for groups to bring people together and to have dialogue. I know some people who don't even go to Beit Jala anymore because they feel like the Muhammad is keeping an eye on who's going. Uh, and so I wonder how that affects what you're doing. And at the same time, obviously in Israel, you now we're working in the environment created by a government which doesn't seem to be too inclined to peace. And we have just seen this week the release of a report that says there's no demonization in Palestinian textbooks and the Israeli government just can't accept that and has, has, has taken a, uh, a very aggressive stance against it. And so this creates on in both sides, I think, a very difficult um, situation for you to bring people together, and I wonder how you deal with that and how your participants feel about about that. According to the normalization, actually, the people who make normalization, uh, yeah, they will have a problem. Uh, for us, it's not normalization. I don't accept that, and no one uh, like claimed to me that it's normalization. Uh, normalization comes from the uh, the, the Palestinian people with the years of dialogue with the Israelis, uh, they, they didn't see this support from the, like the Israeli society in general. Uh, so only to talk to the Israelis as dialogue group, it's not enough. We need to create a partnership. If you want to make peace with your enemy, and they are our enemy, they are not our brothers, you need to work with him, then he became your partner. So what we are doing, we are not talking to each other only. We are working on the ground together. We are facing the occupation together. So the normalization, it depends in which organization. We have this accept acceptance, actually, the, uh, the parent circle and the combatants for peace, and many other. The other question, actually, I didn't. Um, you're talking about Bruce Wexler's book, I take it. So it's very interesting because this question comes up all the time. It's so dumb what the, what the government did about that because, you know, um, it just draws so much more attention. I, it's been in every newspaper all over the world. So this is very indicative of the wise moves of our government. And um, an interesting question comes up all the time. People say to me, why do the Palestinians teach their children to hate? And I say, if I was brought up in the Haitian refugee camp, I wouldn't need a curriculum to teach me to hate. That's a stupid answer, but it's the truth. Okay. My name is Jonathan Morgenstein, actually. I used to work here at USIP. I'm, I'm curious, when you show this film to Israelis and Palestinians in Israel, in Palestine, what is the biggest pushback that you get? What is the... What is the kind of biggest negative reaction? I can imagine that there are people who say, wow, this is great, this is what we need. What, how often and what do people say when they say, this is crap, this is not the truth? 
Well, what's interesting is the Palestinians think it's pro-Israeli and the Israelis think it's pro-Palestinian. So that's great. It means we did something right. Um, it's not always accepted like it's not fairy tales, you know. And um, we've had, you know, there's that scene in the film with the, with the Israeli settler who says that the Palestinians are occupying Israel. So I was in a refugee camp called El Fawa, which is near to Hebron. And in the middle, when they said that, I suddenly heard rumblings and rumblings in the audience, and the whole thing exploded. And um, we had to turn on the lights, and they were shouting and screaming, and there were people there from the Hamas and from Fatah and from the uh, Front, Palestinian Front, Liberation Front. And I was there with a Palestinian partner. The screaming and shouting was unbelievable. But I, I think I don't have any fear. You know, what else can happen to me? So I was waiting to see if it would calm down so we could start the film again, and it didn't. It just went on and on. So I took my hand and I went bang on the table, and I started to tell them about the parent circle and what we're doing and, and who the people are behind the gun. And it suddenly calmed down because they got the human side of the story. They saw my humanity. They didn't see, because when I came in, they started screaming, Al-Jundi, you know, soldier, uh, Netanyahu, Lieberman, screaming, out, you know. That guy that screamed like that, after I'd finished speaking, came to talk to me. He had an emotional breakthrough. And he told me, you know, um, I lost my brother. And so I invited him and his mother to join the parent circle. And now they called us back because we stopped the film. They want the film again, and they want to have a dialogue with us, and the women who were in that group want to help with, we have a special women's group. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not taken for granted that everybody will love this film and go home, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, but it's important that we show it to people who don't agree with us. We will show it to settlers, to wherever we can, to everybody. Accept the settlers. Okay. Accept. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Um, Diane Perlman, George Mason School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Um, I thought the film was very beautiful and very powerful. And you referred to top down and bottom up, but um, these dialogue groups happen on the mid level of the intelligentsia, and it often. And I've also been involved in dialogue groups for many years. I've been to Dehesha, to Gaza. Um, seeds of Peace, Nevei Shalom, and, um, and I think it helps, it's important, but the problem can't be solved from, uh, as you all know and you've been talking about, it can't be solved from that level um, as long as that the uh, occupation is inherently destabilizing and creates bottom-up issues which evoke top-down responses that wipe out the mid-level. And um, the words of the Hatikva, the Israel National Anthem, or for 2,000 years, we've been longing and yearning, Liotam Chavshibi to be a free people in our own country. And I think the Palestinians also are longing to be free people in our, I think it should be easy or possible for the Israelis to recognize that that yearning is human. It's deep, it's core of um, being human. and. Uh, when Clinton was running for president, there was a, you know, especially, you know, it's the economy stupid. So, I mean, I think it's the occupation stupid. And um, it's a form of structural violence that it's the structure that as long as that's there, that this level helps, but it can't solve it. Thank you. Uh, is there a question in there or just out. a state? Okay, yeah, that's what, fine. Yeah, what do you think? I mean, no, I it's a stupid, question. like, what would it take? to end the occupation. <laughs> Ask Obama. <laughs> next question. So you mean next comment. Uh, Adina Friedman, American University right now. Um, so I'm not usually the optimist in the room, or I'm not always, but I think that as an Israeli who's undergone this, these transformative processes for also for decades, and I know there are others in this room who have, um, with all the pessimism and with all the fact that the, f the conflict's far from being solved, I think anyone who's engaged in this kind of activity, whether in the parent circle or elsewhere, doesn't doubt its, um, its impact. 
And I think, uh, again, watching this film, everyone in the film story resonated with me at some level th with my experience, but the Israeli father who was a pessim an optimist and a pessimist and an optimist in many ways epitomizes a lot of what we're talking about that you have good intentions, you're optimistic, then you discover it's not that simple and you actually have to confront the underlying issues and the pain of the other, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, um, and then you become pessimistic and you could end it there or you, you stick with it and you realize, first of all, you have no choice. What's the other option? And second of all, that I think, again, individually and for others here, it's such a profound experience when you are in it that you don't d doubt its importance. You just wonder what else can we do to amplify it, basically. I just think that if you remember in the film, there's a woman with a black veil, with a beautiful face, Bushra, who told the story of her father died when she was a young child and that the soldiers came and her mother tried to protect them. She's a classic example of somebody who went through a total transformation and um, she lost her son. And she came to a meeting that we had in the parents' circle really to scream at us. And because who else can she tell how sad she is and how angry with the Israelis for killing her child? And in the beginning, she sat with her back to me like this. And slowly, slowly, I started to ask her who she lost. And slowly, slowly, she started to turn. And then I asked her if she'd like to see a picture of David, my son who was killed. And I took it and I held it in my hands like this. And she looked and she looked and she looked and she said, Haram. And suddenly she got it. She got the fact that she and I share the same pain. And she's one of the most active members of the parent circle now. She came to donate blood. We had a blood donation, Palestinian and Israelis together from the group, and we gave it to Palestinian and Israeli hospitals. If you want to uh, watch a clip about that, it's called bloodrelations.org, and you can actually give blood virtually. And uh, it was an amazing day to do that, and she came and we gave blood together. That's very symbolic. So there always are these small um, rewards you know, when you see how she's changed and how she's given up being a victim. One of the best things that can happen to you is if you're not a victim. Hi, Carolyn. I think we have time for one more question. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I've got to go. No, you've you got, you got a moment. <laughs> I'll let you go in a minute. i got a plane. Yeah. This will be quick. Um, I was just hoping you two could share a little bit more about your personal experiences and what really moved you to do this. It's a lot of things, actually. And because we have two minutes, I'll take them. Next time, you will yes. explain. Okay. <laughs> in the beginning, actually, when I was in jail, I saw a movie about the Holocaust. It was my first experience that I see this movie and I understand it's about the Holocaust, about the Jewish. And because I'm in their jail, I want to see this movie as kind of revenge, to see someone win those people. Then after a few minutes, I found myself crying, get sympathy with those innocent people, naked, weak people who are standing to die just because they are Jewish. I think it's the first time that I understand their fear or start even to justify their brutality against me as a child in my village in Hebron as occupiers and say to myself, because of this Holocaust, they are crazy. Uh, and they are crazy, yeah. Then, uh, it's after a long time, actually, uh, I have dialogue with my jailer. There is no dialogue between us in jail. They saw us as just enemies. Uh, they uh, teach them that they, we are uh, terrorists, dangerous people with the blood on our hands, and we know that they are our jailers, so just we hate each other. Uh, we start to talk, he want to convince me that we are settlers and occupiers and Palestinians. We continue killing the Jewish people and he don't understand why we are killers. Uh, then I said to him, I have long seven years, let us talk, maybe we are settlers, I don't know. After a few months, we became friends. He understand that we are not settlers, we are just kids and they create from us fighters. 
uh, then you mean like it's the next point that I, I, I think that with dialogue you can change the other's mind even if they are extremist and he was very extremist but still one one man because the other side for me is uh, uh, soldiers and settlers this is the Israeli people uh, it's it's a long story and very experience and very difficult story in jail they when you release in jail you cannot act as a human being it, it's very difficult they try to kill your humanity every day so you you create more tools to resist to be a human being uh, then after I get released, actually, in 2003, let me say, uh, when we uh, hear about the, in the Israeli media about the refuseniks, I want to meet them. In 2005, we have the first meeting between four Palestinians and seven Israeli. I was uh, 35 years, I think. Uh, then I discovered that we are human beings. We are the same. Uh, it's a longer process actually, but I can say like this three points. And in 1994, when I see the same kids who throw stones in the Israeli patrols before they leave Jenin to the Palestinian Authority, they go to give them flowers. Like, uh, it was a paradox, they are occupiers. And suddenly when they leave, they want to give them flowers. Then I understand that just go home and leave us alone. So since that, I said I'll never support or use armed struggle because it doesn't work. And more than 100 years, we are killing each other. Many states uses us to improve their position in negotiations. And we are uh, 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 bullets in their guns. And we bring to ourselves more pain and more blood and more victims. And we continue. And I think it's the time to decide that we need to break this circle and our lives is more important than the land. Thank you. Just because if you are very fast. Did you want to? Oh, uh, um, OK, another two minutes. I, I started this journey after my son was killed. And um, I knew that I wanted to prevent other families, both Palestinian and Israeli, from experiencing this pain. And I recognized that there was no difference in the pain between me and the Palestinian mother. So it's a very long story. And um, if you speak to Shiri, she'll tell you about the film. I'm sorry that, you know, it isn't that I don't want to share it with you. But it's, it's long, and it's a journey with the man who killed my son. And it's the recognition that the only way to finish this whole madness is with understanding of the other and seeing the humanity in the other. When you see the humanity in the other, it's the end of conflict. I think thank on, you. on that note, please join me in thanking Roby and Bassan. Thank you very much. There is additional information, I believe, outside about Parent Circle Family Forum, also online. And if you want to get more information about USIP and its work, also at usip.org. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.